Hidden within our world are many mysteries. Creatures, plants, and ecosystems barely touched by humanity. But sometimes those places are better left untouched. In the world of Peter Jackson's King Kong, one such place did exist. It was known as Skull Island. Within this island, creatures of both the past and present collide, evolving and competing with each other over ever-shrinking territory in a brutal contest of will. On this island, only one thing is certain. You don't want to become part of the food chain. To understand this complex and unstable ecosystem, let's delve into why it became this way. Skull Island was once part of a continent known as Gondwana Land. Gondwana Land was once a real continent comprised of South America, Africa, India, Australia, and Antarctica. As the land began to break into the more familiar land masses we see today, a single island was left in the sea. When the island was originally formed, it was nearly the size of Madagascar. Unfortunately, this island happened to be smack dab in the middle of the boundary between the Indo-Australian and the Eurasian tectonic plates. Because of its unstable location, Skull Island was being torn apart by the very forces that created it. The animals within were afforded some bit of safety from the extinction events. Every so often, the power of the tectonic plates would create a land bridge, allowing new fauna to come into the island. While the creatures within were safe from the extinction events, they had a much different crisis to worry about. The turbulent forces that were tearing Skull Island apart caused more and more of it to sink with each passing year. This change forced the animals into far more intense competition over time. As more and more land disappeared, it became more and more of a battle for survival of the fittest. This happened to cause an insane evolutionary arms race, turning these creatures into a menagerie of nightmares. This incredibly unstable environment caused Skull Island to produce many more predators than it did herbivores and most of the herbivores that did survive earned their place. So without further ado, let's get right into it. Naturally, we're gonna start with dinosaurs. Let's start with the herbivores. Some of the animals on Skull Island are enormous, and one of the best examples of that is Brontosaurus. Despite them sharing a name with a real animal, these guys have many differences that sets them apart from their real counterpart. These massive animals could reach 80 to 120 feet, or 25 to 37 meters. While there's no official weight, let's do some estimations here. We estimate the real Brontosaurus at around 72 feet in length and about 20 tons. If we upscale the weight to the 120 foot or 37 meter mark, we see that these animals could reach an excess of 30 tons. And that's not even taking into account that these animals seem to be quite a bit bulkier than their real life counterparts. On Skull Island, Brontosaurus has little to no competition with other herbivores for the plants that it likes to eat since it's the tallest animal on the island. But that being said, with the island shrinking yearly, it didn't have the resources to provide enough food for the standard sauropod method of laying eggs. Typically, sauropods laid a lot of eggs to increase the chances of at least one of them surviving. The Brontosaurus on Skull Island are viviparous, which means they give birth to live young. Some of the trade-offs of this strategy means that they made less young in the first place. They'd give birth to between one to three live young that could walk within hours of their birth. However, this did significantly reduce infant mortality, allowing more of the juveniles to grow up to adulthood. These young would be cared for by the entire herd, typically ranging from six to 20 individuals. Each herd would have been led by an alpha male that released a pheromone to prevent other males from reaching full maturity, thus allowing him to keep his dominance. Those suppressed males would usually stand on the edges of the group to prevent other more important members from getting killed. Typically, as females matured, they'd leave their herd and go off to find another one of their own. There were only two real threats to the species on the island, the Venatosaurus and the Vastatosaurus rex. We'll get to those guys a little bit later. Brontosaurus also has a rudimentary form of communication. These animals would stomp on the ground and then detect those vibrations in their feet with specialized pads. This would allow them to communicate danger or finding new food sources. But that's just the start of this island's mysteries and wonders. One of these wonders is a ceratopsian known as Ferracutus cerestes. This species reached about 24 to 34 feet in length, or 7 to 10 meters, and they were much larger than most other ceratopsians. This ceratopsian usually roams in herds of about 12 individuals, but sometimes they do fly solo. They are incredibly territorial, doing so allows them to give their young the best chance of success. Their territorial nature causes them to be extremely aggressive, especially the lead bull. If a carnivore attacks the herd, the females will create a circle around the young to protect them. Meanwhile, the males, led by the bull, will lead a charge against the threat. The males will rely on their horns, frills, and powerful muscles to carry the day for them. When it comes to this species, the larger the frill, the more senior the animal is. 
The largest males will have enormous frills that boast horns that reach upwards of six feet in length, just under two meters. And in desperate situations, their beak, usually used for shearing plants and wood, can be used against flesh as well. During the mating season, their frills will change colors, and the males with more impressive displays can sometimes even intimidate rivals before a fight even breaks out. That being said, fights between Farracutus males occur fairly frequently and often result in injury or even death. Because of their large size and intimidating appearance, even a full-grown V-Rex would think twice before taking on an enraged bull Farracutus. They also have an interesting way of getting rid of parasites. Skull Island is home to an abundance of termites, and they will purposely rub their bodies up against termite mounds. Doing so aggravates the termites into attacking, and due to their thick skin, the termites don't bother Farracutus at all. And while Farracutus is safe from the termites, it clears its body of any unwanted ride-alongs. But Farracutus isn't even one of the most densely protected herbivores on the island. Enter Diablosaurus, the most well-defended herbivore on Skull Island. Despite the way it looks, it's neither a Ceratopsian nor an Ankylosaurid. These guys are actually a very untraditional sauropod. For a sauropod, these guys have significantly reduced necks and tails. But instead of either of those, they developed incredibly dense armor plating along with some very powerful horns. While the horns could definitely be weapons, especially in males, these guys actually use them as a form of rudimentary identification. No two individuals will ever have the same series of horns and osteoderms, making them incredibly unique. By the time this species reaches its full length at about 20 to 25 feet or 6 to 7 and a half meters, these guys have the most powerful armor protection on the island. In fact, Diablosaurus is so protected that when they're fully grown, they have no natural predators. Even the dominant predators of the island like the V-Rex and the Carvers can't do anything against a full-grown Diablosaurus. With that being said, until they reach maturity, this species is still vulnerable as their armor isn't fully hardened until they reach adult size. But because the young are always so well defended by the parents in the first place, it's hard to get even to them. Because of how few predators these guys have, they're also viviparous like Brontosaurus. This helps prevent them from becoming overpopulated while also giving the young the best chance of survival. Their lack of predators also caused their eyesight to get worse over time because they didn't really need it as much. They also developed very rhino-like lips and actually fulfilled the same niche as the rhino on the mainland. Much like rhinos, these guys usually will only travel in small family groups or solo. While Diablosaurus definitely has the best armor on the island, I think there's another herbivore that definitely has more intimidating armor. Enter Pugiodorsus. This is a species of Thyreophoran dinosaur, meaning they're related to animals like stegosaurids and ankylosaurids. They weren't the largest animals, reaching about 9 feet or 2.7 meters, but they make up for it by being incredibly alert and having deadly armor spikes. If a predator gets into a chase with this animal, they're going to have to be extremely careful about where they bite to avoid those spikes. And they are still incredibly fast for an animal as heavily armored as they are. Because on this island, around every other corner, there's a danger. Sometimes that danger comes in the form of the incredibly rare Atercurisaurus. This is a relatively large species of stegosaurid, reaching about 16 to 20 feet, or about 4.8 to 6 meters. These are the last of the stegosaurids on Skull Island, and they have some of the most impressive armor anywhere on the island. Aside from the standard arrangement of stegosaurid plates, they also had osteoderms that served as further protections running along their side. And instead of having just the tip of their tail spiked, they have the entirety of their rear spiked. Their thagomizer spikes run all the way from the top of the back legs all the way down to the back of the tail. And yet, despite all these impressive displays, it's one of the rarest dinosaurs on the island. The reason for their decline is not predators, it's actually themselves and other herbivores. The species only eats very specific plants around the interior of the island, and they still have to share them with other generalist herbivores. This competition caused their numbers to continually decline. The herds that remain consisted of about 12 individuals or so, usually consisting of all females. They also had what was referred to as satellite males, which were males that would roam nearby the herd and would never be too far away until the breeding season. This species also communicated extremely well for a dinosaur. They had a sound they made when they were reassuring the rest of the herd that no predators were around. The babies and young made various squeaks and squeals to get food, but the adults actually mimicked that sound to show their submission to the matriarch. They also had very specific sounds for very specific threats, allowing the adults to react accordingly whenever a youngster was in danger. And while they could defend themselves and their young exceptionally well, unfortunately they fell victim to one of the leading causes of extinction, overspecialization. This next animal is still pretty specialized, but not overly so. This is a mountain-dwelling ceratopsia known as Bifurcatops. They reached about 6 to 10 feet in length, or 1.8 to 3 meters. 
These creatures have incredibly long legs, allowing them to dwell in mountainous regions. They may be the smallest ceratopsian on Skull Island, but that small size allows them to take advantage of the minimal resources found within the mountains. Because of their chosen terrain, they only have a few natural predators, like the Dromaeosaur Arstartacades, as well as the Therapsid Gladiodon. But they're still not the easiest target, even for those predators, because they can climb similar to the way goats do today. Because of that, this is one ceratopsian that doesn't focus on combat at all. Their horseshoe-shaped frill is incredibly fragile and not good for combat, unlike other animals like Ferracutus. Instead, this frill is used exclusively for mating, where males will do elaborate dances to impress females. Because for some animals, looks definitely are everything. But of course, they're not the only specialized ceratopsian on Skull Island. This is the Silva Ceratops, a ceratopsian specialized at living exclusively in the jungle or dense forests. Much like Bifurcatops, these animals were slimmer and more slender and long-legged than their standard ceratopsian. This allowed the animal to run incredibly nimbly throughout the forest, making it much easier for them to escape from predators. 99% of the time, this species is going to choose to run rather than fight, but only during the mating season when they have eggs will they defend their brood. Reaching about 12 to 16 feet, or 3.6 to 4.8 meters, these guys would stand their ground by planting their head directly downwards and using their incredibly tall frill as a shield. Unlike Bifurcatops, these guys' shields were definitely strong enough to defend themselves, as well as during the mating season, they used them in physical contests against other males. During the mating season, they would develop hook-like horns that would allow them to grapple with other males during combat. They would shed these horns after the mating season to minimize the chance of snags or entanglements. Even after winning the right to mate, they still have to impress a female. To help them with that, during the mating season, their frills also develop extremely bright and flashy colors, allowing them to do an incredible display. Speaking of displays, one of the most impressive animals on the island is actually the second largest sauropod. This is another armored sauropod known as Asperdorsus. These massive sauropods reach about 36 to 42 feet in length, or about 11 to 13 meters. Like ankylosaurs, these guys are studded with osteoderms, serving as armor protection. And while it doesn't protect them as well as, say, Diablosaurus, it's still an incredibly dense set of armor. And the top of their back is lined with incredibly long spikes that can impale a clumsy enemy. These guys are part of the group of sauropods that includes the real-life animal Diplodocus. That, along with many years of evolution on the island, allowed them to become much more narrow than the standard sauropod. This feature allowed Asperdorsus to live in the deepest jungles of Skull Island, away from most of the predators. In fact, the only predators that can bring one down are the Venatosaurus or the Carvers, and they have to find one first. This species has an incredible sense of smell, allowing it to track down its favorite food throughout the dense jungle. And because they like a variety of different fruits, they migrate yearly whenever the fruit begins to ripen. These guys are standardly solitary animals, except for during the mating season. During this time, the males will level areas of forest and then make loud bellowing calls to attract the females to him. The females of Asperdorsus are attracted to the loudest and most destructive of the males. A rather intriguing creature overall. The island's only hadrosaur, as well as the most common herbivore on the island, is none other than Legocrestus. Legocrestus is a lambiosaurine, meaning they're related to animals like Sauralophus. They reach about 26 to 34 feet in length, or about 8 to 10.3 meters. Because of how common they are, Legocrestus is one of the main sources of food for most of the island's large predators. Because they have no real outward defenses, their main defense from large predators is just being alert. However, this species is fairly fast, so carnivores still have to work for their meal. They also happen to be incredibly strong swimmers, which makes them one of the few prey species on Skull Island that can take to the water to avoid land-based predators. Because of how strong of swimmers they are, to avoid predators, many Legocrestus mothers will actually nest in swampy, sandy areas where there are less predators overall. These areas are usually blocked off and covered by water, which would require a swim to get to it. The eggs are then abandoned on the island, but when they hatch, they begin to make calls that draw the parents back to them. The adults will then spend a few days nurturing all the infants on the island, getting them strong enough to make the river crossing. Unfortunately for the young, this is the perfect opportunity that many of the river predators are waiting for, and they often get eaten during this crossing. But that's part of the reason this species actually is incredibly numerous on the island. They lay a ton of eggs to help with their infant mortality rate. And during the mating season, Legocrestus is one of the only male groups that don't fight amongst each other. Legocrestus' skin flap is actually filled with chromatophores, and during the breeding season, they'll flush color into there to help show that they're ready for breeding. Males compete with each other by trying to have the most brilliant displays, and females will often choose the crest that impresses them the most. Their crest also serves as an incredibly important function for communication. 
Using their crests, they can produce sounds to let each other know when it's safe, when it's dangerous, when they need to take care of each other, etc. And like Adderkirisaurus, different sounds means different things. Legal Creases' success is also what makes it the most eaten animal on the island, making up the main course for most of the island's large predators. And I suppose you'll be wanting to hear about some of those large predators, huh? But before we get into that, Skull Island actually has some insectivorous and omnivorous dinosaurs too. Among them is a minuscule animal named Panatudamus, otherwise known as the Feather Devil. Feather Devils are small insectivores, reaching about 6 inches or 15 centimeters in length. These guys are very similar in appearance to an animal known as Microraptor. But while it may appear that the species has feathers, don't let that fool you, it doesn't. They actually have a special type of scale that flicks open any time they try to fly. Which means they're not actually true flyers, rather than gliders. Despite that, they are the most agile creature in the air on the island, able to change direction mid-flight. And similar to modern-day geckos, this species can bark. They do so mostly to communicate with their own kind, usually over territory or mates. And it's said that during certain times of year on Skull Island, the forest rings out with all of these guys, and it sounds very similar to frogs. Another very intriguing creature is the omnivorous Avarusaurus. This was a rather large dinosaur, reaching about 18 to 26 feet, or about 5.5 to 8 meters. This animal was both bipedal and quadrupedal, switching between whichever worked best for the certain terrain that it was on. And these guys were omnivorous, meaning they ate everything from fruit to vegetables to meat. Think of them kind of like the bear of the dinosaurs. They have an incredibly acidic stomach, allowing them to digest anything, even rotting flesh. And they came equipped with large claws that they would use to defend themselves from predators like Photodon. While this next animal may look intimidating, it's actually specialized to hunt mollusks. This dinosaur is known as Acedactylus, and it reached about 12 to 15 feet or 3.5 to 4.5 meters. Despite this dinosaur's rather unnerving appearance, this animal is actually rather placid. And while this animal is technically a carnivore, it's specialized in eating mollusks, crabs, and other shellfish. The toes on their feet are incredibly wide and splayed to help prevent them from sinking into the mud in their territory. But their most unique adaption is their second set of nostrils. This second set of nostrils sits high on their head and allows them to breathe while the front of their face is sifting through the mud for food. They could also actually blow air out of the second nostril, allowing them to make trumpeting calls to one another as well. And while this animal is definitely normally placid, it can defend itself with its incredibly long and blade-like claws. But this island is home to even weirder creatures than that. This curious little dinosaur is an animal known as Falcatops. This species reached about 8 to 9 feet in length, or about 2.4 to 2.7 meters. These animals are very stork-like, but they come from a very basal group of dinosaurs known as Coelophysids. Their beak is extremely well adapted to slide into the shell of mollusks and rip them right out, making them an incredibly weird but not necessarily dangerous part of Skull Island's fauna. Among these oddities is a dinosaur known as Furcodactylus. Like the Feather Devil, these guys are pretty small, only reaching about 2.5 feet or just over 3 quarters of a meter. This species has incredibly long and splayed toes, similar to modern-day water birds like the Jacana. They use these feet in combination with their small size to wade through the water or sit on lily pads to wait for fish to swim nearby, allowing these guys to take over a rather unoccupied niche on the island. They're definitely a curious little critter. But Skull Island has no shortage of fishing dinosaurs, and another example of this is Ambulacusaurus. These guys were a rather large dromaeosaur, reaching about 10 to 14 feet or 3 to 4 and a quarter meter. This species is incredibly specialized in catching fish, their eyes even have a special adaptation to reduce the glare from the water. This species is also intelligent, and to further aid them, they also choose spots that are more shaded to even give them a better chance of spotting their prey. They also happen to share traits with another known group of dinosaurs known as the Unanlagani, which is another group of dromaeosaurs. Unlike these guys, the Unanlagani are real and might be where they got inspiration for this dinosaur. These guys have a long and narrow jaw with thinner needle-like teeth, this made them extremely adept at catching fish, and they were even able to catch fish up to half the size of their own body. Very similar to modern bears, these guys had a special relationship with a species of freshwater mullet on the island. Much like some modern-day salmon species, this mullet's breeding season forced it to go upriver, right into the waiting arms of Ambulacusaurus. These dinosaurs have done this so much and have such a good memory for it that they even have traditional spots that they and their hatchlings will go and catch fish at. And though fights are incredibly rare amongst members of the species, this is about the only time it typically happens. However, one of Skull Island's most dangerous fish eaters is without a doubt the Parasodon. This species was relatively large, reaching about 12 to 16 feet or 3.5 to about just under 5 meters. 
They have an incredibly dragon-like appearance, reminding me of the Draco Rex from Primeval. This species is found across various waterways on the island, but usually sticks to the more coastal areas. Their teeth are relatively thin, but rather than being used specifically for fish, they can also be used for prey, which is what makes this animal more dangerous. These guys are usually ambush predators and will wait in the water for anything smaller than them to swim past. And because of how powerful their claws are, they can wait in ambush even in the most raging surfs. And when it's not holding on with those claws, it can use them to lash out and snatch up any prey unsuspecting nearby. Definitely the most dangerous of Skull Island's fish eaters. Now, let's get into the, uh, meat and bones, if you will. The first two major carnivores we're going to talk about are two of Skull Island's large forest racids, otherwise known as terror birds. The first of these animals is Xeropteryx, a powerful and colorful forest racid. This species reached about 5 to 6 feet, or 1.5 to 1.8 meters at the hip. Xeropteryx is incredibly stocky, with powerful legs to run down any prey it finds. In fact, this species is fast enough and cunning enough to hunt down even Legocrisis. For most prey, all that's required is one swing of their head, and they use it similar to a pickaxe. And this species is bold enough that it goes through both the jungle and the open plains of the island. And while it's a true terror bird, there's one other species on this island that dwarfs even Xeropteryx. And that would be the species known as Brutornis. These massive birds reached about 6 to 7 feet, or 1.8 to 2.1 meters, at the hip. And their neck is incredibly long, much longer than Xeropteryx. This pale-colored terror bird was the largest of its kind on the island. It hunted in mainly low scrubland, using its massive beak to kill anything in a single swift bite. They have extremely keen eyesight, able to detect even the slightest movement in the grasses below them. Because of how powerful and dangerous these animals can be, most other animals leave them alone, with one exception. A Gorgonopsid known as Lycosaurus has developed a special method to lure the Brutornis mother away from her nest of eggs. However, this doesn't always work, but we'll get more into that in the future videos. But I tell you, it's an incredibly bold animal that tries to steal from this mother. Speaking of nests, one of Skull Island's best nest raiders was Adlapsusaurus. This small, nimble, and leaf dinosaur only reached about 5 to 7 feet long, or about 1.5 to 2.1 meters. This species typically ran on both its hind legs, but they have been observed to walk on their knuckles as well, kind of like gorillas. They have incredibly keen hearing and extremely developed eyesight. Adlapsusaurus will raid any nest on the island, even those belonging to V-Rex. And it was rather successful at it too, even under the V-Rex's nose. And while they did specialize in eggs, they would never pass up the opportunity for a fresh hatchling as well. This species also has two incredibly bright red crests that it uses for display, similar to Dilophosaurus. This next animal has no displays like that, but it doesn't really need it. This is a dromaeosaur named Arsardicades, otherwise known as Asardus. Like most of Skull Island's dromaeosaurs, Asardus is relatively large, reaching about 8 to 12 feet in length or about 2.4 to 3.6 meters. In an odd turn of events, this dromaeosaur actually happens to run on all four legs as opposed to being bipedal. This is because they choose to live in the mountain range, where their main source of prey is bifurcatops. Being quadrupedal allows them to not only be more stealthy, but also allows them to traverse the rocky terrain they live in much more effectively. It acts similar to a modern-day snow leopard, where it will get as close as possible to the prey before launching an attack. When it does finally catch a prey animal, it will pin it down and then use a lethal bite to finish it off. And with a standard dromaeosaur killing claw, it would be much easier for them to hold down their prey. They're not the most impressive of Skull Island's dromaeosaurs, but we'll get to them right after this next dinosaur. This is Skull Island's second largest carnivorous dinosaur, the Tartarosaurus. These absolute massive carnivores reached about 20 to 28 feet in length, or 6 to 8.5 meters. These are incredibly large, heavy, and bulky animals with incredibly thick skin that protects them from most forms of harm. Their preferred prey is Skull Island's native seal population. Because of that, this species tends to be nomadic overall, following the seals wherever they go. They prey upon everything on the coast, including the human villagers that live on one side of the island. And while this species is nomadic, they will defend whatever stretch of territory they claim at that moment in time. They also happen to be equipped with powerful jaws and long, scythe-like claws. They're usually also able to rear up on their hind legs to defend themselves or attack even better. You can kind of think of Tartarosaurus as the coastal equivalent of V-Rex. Because to a human, they're definitely just as dangerous. Venatosaurus is the largest and most dangerous dromaeosaur within Skull Island. These enormous dromaeosaurs reach about 16 to 24 feet in length, or about 4.8 to 7.3 meters. 
These dromaeosaurs had become very specialized to this island life. While not as fast as their prehistoric counterparts, they were far more agile and flexible. This flexibility allowed them to use even the sparsest of cover while hunting, allowing them to ambush prey other predators couldn't. To further aid with this, their eyes were actually set on the top of their head, which allowed them to see over the cover they were hiding behind. Aside from all that, they've also shown an extreme level of intelligence, making them the second most dangerous dinosaur on all of Skull Island. These dromaeosaurs also had a special relationship with the brontosaurus of the island, being one of the only predators that could take down a full-grown one. But wait, how do they take out such massive herbivores if they're so small in comparison? With that intelligence that I mentioned earlier, this species will actually trick and force brontosaurus into more dangerous areas of the island, where they can fall off cliffs. They've learned ways to scare the brontosauruses into moving. Their intelligence also leads them to be social animals, consisting of packs of about 6 to 12 members with a numerous amount of younglings. While a majority of the pack would go out hunting, one or two guards would be left behind to defend the nests and the young. These predators would hunt any and everything on the island, second to only one other dinosaur. And that is none other than Vastatosaurus rex. This massive tyrannosaur is not only Skull Island's largest carnivorous dinosaur, but their largest terrestrial carnivore. Reaching 40 to 50 feet in length, or about 12.1 to 15 and a quarter meter, this was no joke. Aside from having the standard Tyrannosaur body plan, these guys also possess thick, scaly armor in the form of osteoderms. Their skull is also incredibly thick and reinforced, even more so than standard Tyrannosaurs. Like the Venatosaurus, they have a surprising degree of flexibility due to the fact of living on the island for so long. As juveniles, V-Rexes tend to stick to the thick jungle interior to avoid the larger predators of the island. Once they reach maturity, these animals tend to fly solo, and they will even defend their territory from other V-Rexes, especially from other V-Rexes. The only exception to this is during the mating season, where males will leave their territory to search for a female. Sometimes, bold young males will use this opportunity to take territory for themselves. However, because there's often a size difference, most of the time fights don't happen and the younger male just runs away. Most V-Rexes won't challenge one another if their opponent is larger, however, if they are evenly matched, that's usually when a fight will break out. The oldest and strongest V-Rexes often bear scars of many such battles. Because of their size, V-Rexes will hunt any and everything on the island. However, they'll usually attack easier prey, such as Legocrestus, using a surprising degree of stealth for an animal of their size. They will also often bully smaller predators off of their kills. All of these features and more make V-Rex the most dangerous predator on Skull Island. As you can see, Skull Island has no shortage of jaw-dropping and awe-inspiring dinosaurs. And dinosaurs are just the start, make sure to keep an eye out for the other Skull Island fauna videos. I'd also like to thank all the folks at Weta Workshop who put all the time and effort into making this amazing world. As well as their great artists like Greg Broadmore and Christian Pierce that brought this world to life and they made a majority of the artwork that appears in this video. Thank you all for being so patient with me while I put this video together, and I hope you enjoyed. As always, make sure to be good people, and I'll see you in the next one.